Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to the traditional Thomas. For those of you tuning in for the first time, welcome. My name is Nicholas Cavazos, and I have my two good friends here, Jordan Pacheco and Rudy Carlos from the Glad Trad podcast. Again, if you guys haven't subscribed to the Glad Trad podcast as many times as I've had them on by now, what are you doing? <laughs> are you even Catholic? I don't know. So you just need to do mm. this. How are you guys doing? <laughs> I'm great, Nick. Thank you for having us. Uh, yeah, everything's yeah, excellent. It is, it's always a blast and a half. Yeah, no, it. I, I kind of thought about it uh, kind of like we talked about even before we went on. Even just the last like two months that we haven't seen each other, the craziness in the church, both good and bad, has ramped up to 11 between mm -hmm. the dubia that came out in December. What was that, like two or three days before Christmas, something like that? Uh, as well as the stuff this week with the Fatima consecrations. Are they going to be legit? Are they not? So first off, um, yeah, what are your guys' thoughts on the dubia? Because I know that whenever I saw it, my pretty much my only initial thing was this is terrible, but I mean, I kind of saw it coming. So that's all I really had to say about it. So what were your guys' <laughs> overall thoughts on it? Um... Jordan, you go first. You got it, my brother. Okay, so man, you know it's funny. It's, there's so much stuff that's happened that, that already seems like a forever ago. So on yeah. one hand, <laughs> yeah, right. Like my first reaction was, "Wow, this is terrible!" Like, how, a lightning bolts from the sky, if you please, God, please, like, say it's not so. Um, call into question or just resist it. You know, I mean, you know how it works. And then I, I really lately, especially because of the project I've been working on at work, right? Um, eternal rest, death and dying. I've just been really meditating about what what does it mean for us to have the time that we have here? And also like at the end of the day, like the church is a very funny institution because the Holy Spirit holds a church. Like Christ, Christ governs a church and there's a lot of politics um, and what are politics, but ethics and morality played out in, in real time in some ways, you know? Mm -hmm. So, or at least they ought to be. Um, so I thought to myself, you know, even church politics like this, which is really messy and this is just purely it. This isn't obviously for the glory and honor of, of Christ and certainly the honor of the mass. <laughs> like I like, I'm, I'm grateful that it seemed like there wasn't going to be a hammer down on say the fraternity of St. Peter. Mm -hmm. Um, that was nice, but the diocesan Latin mass is in many places it's disappeared In other places it's just completely stripped. It's not about growth. It's not really about the salvation of souls. So again, we are in an era where it seems like the church hierarchy really gleefully likes breaking the first law of the church, which is mm -hmm. the salvation of souls. And then I said, okay, well, that all being said, um, it's not up to me. Like, what am I going to do? Okay. Suppose that, suppose that the Latin mass is taken. Well, I'm just going to go, I'll go find one. Like I've completely, I've had a bit of a, of a, a white pill, I should say on, obviously on the society that that's long gone, but mm -hmm. even just understanding like, what does it fundamentally mean to be like a husband and a father to want to really be dutiful to the magisterium and teaching authority of the church and your love of the Catholic church? Does every independent chapel that's not set of a content, like if I find an independent chapel, that's not set of a content in those terms. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I, I, I don't know. I don't know how God would judge me, but I'd hope that he would see that such things would be out of love. I don't have that issue. Um, and I, God willing, I won't have that issue, but I just, for me, I just realized that, you know, if I just throw my, you know, Christ came into the world to, to save us and to, to, to call his friends, not slaves. And therefore, like, if we do things out of acts of love, obviously in the bonds of what it means to be a Catholic, but really to do them motivated by desiring to love Christ over man, that's an important thing in the church that needs to be rediscovered again. And I think that things like the dubia, things like traditional custodes, even the current stuff that Pope Francis has done, even the more positive things, I know, which is crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think that's teaching me that, you know, this is ultimately God's church. This isn't our church or, or Pope Francis' church or anyone else's. This is Christ. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I had a, a sort of a, a like a similar outlook to there, but also just a, a little bit different, you know. Um, I I had been going to the society church for a long time, and I I have confidence that the society is it wasn't affected by this sort of thing. So I, I sort of kind of brushed it off in a way, but then I started thinking. You know, what happens to all of these different people who are participating in a fraternity mass or a diocesan mass, and they're just getting the, the rug swept out from underneath them? That's just so sad and, and really cruel when you think about it. I mean, think about the, the timeline of, of how this went down, right? It turns out that on during, like, was it Christmas Day or Christmas Eve, they yeah, like, sent out right this... Up honestly yeah so it, it's very it's a very cruel heavy-handed thing uh our, I, I believe he's an archbishop archbishop roche mm -hmm. um did um and then on the other hand i started thinking you know because now that i'm in texas this is something that i've i've thought about i really wish that there was a diocesan latin mass around me you know i long for the days where we could go to our local parish Mm -hmm. And I can't do that, obviously, because if I go to my local parish, I'm going to get scandalized. You know, most mm -hmm. of the time, like 99.9% .9 of the time, yeah. you're going to go in there and you're going to get scandalized. But I just, I wish for that. I, I long for that. I long for the, for the Latin Mass to be more accessible to everybody so that people can see the reverence and the love that people uh, have for God, that these priests have for God, mm -hmm. that the Mass reflects all of the truths of, of the Catholic Church. And, um, you know, here in Texas, it's a little difficult now. I have my, my daughter, she's seven months old. It's, it's tough to get in the car for 45 minutes to go to the parish, but we make do. And actually here in Texas, I'm, um, I'm going to a fraternity church because it's, it's uh, a lot closer. So I, I kind of fear that, you know, I, 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 sense, uh, I sense that uh, the fraternity and other other Latin mass parishes, I think, are kind of walking on eggshells. And so, especially here and in Los Angeles, because they still keep contact with people there, it seems as if these parishes are really, really walking on eggshells, especially when it comes to participating in uh, capital campaigns for the diocese, which like fund all kinds of different things that you, you don't know or you might not want to support. Um, it, it's odd to, to be, again, in a position outside of the society church where you know there may be an instance where it could be taken away from us so it's very uh it's a very strange time but like jordan says you know i you, know, you have to you have to appreciate what you have right now and and make the best that you can mm -hmm. yeah no i i definitely can relate a lot with what you guys are saying it sounds like for the most part we've all kind of had interesting shifts over the last two months so for me for me myself I went to for the longest time my diocesan Latin mass and we never had traditional sacraments aside from when you requested them. And so um, I would serve, for instance, the odd traditional mass uh, in the context of a wedding, or um, we would have the, you know, I would serve during a traditional baptism or something to that effect. Uh, but then uh, I'm kind of a person that likes to peer far down the timeline and be like okay what's realistically going to happen it's probably good that i like build my mm -hmm. trench here if you will before the deadline hits and so i just kind of saw it coming so whenever the dubia came out the thing that i guess scandalized and infuriated me the most was just kind of like you were saying jordan the lack of the desire for the salvation of souls but specifically applied in the lines of you're not allowed to even publicize latin masses and yeah. and i'm like oh when you take these things i'm like well who benefits from this well clearly the devil he's the only one that truly benefits from from that and so for me you know i have a bunch of friends that i'm really close to and so i just told him i said you know um obviously i don't have a problem with the sspx um i believe everything that they believe in but i just go to a diocesan for convenience sake um, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to jump and go to the SSPX. So a bunch of friends in my, me went from the diocesan Latin mass world to the SSPX. And we've been mm -hmm. going a few months now and it's a whole nother world. And it's so, so much better. <laughs> um, from, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's infinitely better from not just the fact that I'm getting all the sacraments the way they ought to be done, but also the fact that we're hearing real preaching for the first time. Cause again, you know, the problem that we've, 
find, and, and I do want to throw this out there for viewers who still go to diocesan Latin mass. I'm glad you go, right? Definitely. If that's all you have around your go, go to that. But one food for thought I'd like to throw out there is that it's like one of my friends said, what's the good in a certain sense, not in a complete sense, but in a certain sense of going to a diocesan Latin mass when you're still going to be receiving a Novus Ordo homily, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And so it's kind of this idea that again, right, we don't go to mass because of the sermon, but uh, the sermon is still important to hear. Um, and so therefore, when we hear sermons that are, yeah, essentially referencing all of this quasi-modernist um, belief, yeah. or at least stuff that's not sufficiently Catholic to feed your mm -hmm. soul, that's sad. And when we went to the SSPX, actually hearing the word sin, mortal sin, mm -hmm. hell, these things brought up, this was the first time in my life as either a Catholic or a Protestant, where in person I was hearing these words. Um, mm, wow. And, you know, I'm 23 and I was like, wow, this is a massive breath of fresh air. So um, I wow. definitely, Praise God. God. yeah, I feel it, it was, it, it, I can relate with the white pill comment because I feel very at peace about it. Cause I just know that mm. hypothetically, right. Two or three months from now, God forbid, we have yeah. another thing come down. I'm like, I'm okay, you know, we're, we're all good. Well, and this is, this is something, you know, I mean, it's good talking to a scholastic about this, certainly, but, mm -hmm. you know, as Catholics, I, 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 as a Catholic, I like the idea that the church has answers and that we're not here to make it about ourselves. We're here to follow after the voice of the church because he who hears the church hears the voice of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. St. Ignatius of Antioch says where Christ is, there is a Catholic church. And you're like, okay, cool. So like, tell me, like, but you know what, like the church does go through reformation, not revolution, God forbid, but reformation. And I think that we're in a reformation right now. We are with Catholics and you hear how traditional Catholics talk or those who are jumping ship talk. We're not, not everything we do is just because of the negative of the Novus Ordo is scandalous. Is it, is it deficient? Mm -hmm. uh, it really comes down to the, the very familial aspect of our souls. We're not being fed. We want to follow the voice of Christ. And he has given us a voice for 2000 years. And in plenty of times in 2000 year history, Catholics have looked left and looked right. And the church that was local to them, the church that was supposed to be the pillar and foundation of the truth, sometimes just hasn't been. Um, I'm reading again, because he's one of my patrons, um, The Life of Sir Thomas More by Peter Ackroyd. And he's one of my favorites. But one thing to remember about Sir Thomas More is that it was him and it was, it was Bishop John Fisher. Mm -hmm. The entirety of the Church of England okayed the marriage. The entirety of the, the lawyer and the political class okayed the marriage. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was just slippery slope. And so what would it feel like to go into a place that had the truth, had the sacraments, and maybe even has the appearances of the truth in the sacraments, in his case, but it wasn't the truth and mm -hmm. wasn't the sacraments because they were consciously or even unconsciously going against the teachings of the Church. And... You know, I know that like there's a lot of talks about obedience. Um, Rudy and I talked about this a lot two years ago, the limits of obedience and stuff. And I think we were just trying. <laughs> I know, right? What, I a, what a long that. time ago. Huh? Yeah, those were those those were just like salad days compared to, yeah. to this. <laughs> but there is kind of a piece of realizing like we've spent a lot of times as trads like trying to like be very legalistic and properly so about like the jurisdiction, the, the proper obligations, these sorts of things. And I think that actually there's something we can borrow from the actual reformers of the church, from the St. Francis's and even from the Thomas More's of just understanding that, you know, God, God loves us so radically and so deeply. And that that love sometimes will put you at odds with a pope, mm -hmm. the bishop. It might put you at odds against even your own family. And so conscious it, conscience is not just like the, the, the understanding, the importance of conscience is not just a Vatican II post buzzword. It's something that is very deeply involved in the life of the church. And so if your conscience really says, you know, at the end of the day, I want to follow after Jesus. I want to receive the sacrament. I want to raise my children in the mass of my fathers and my grandfathers. And it takes you to a place where you're going to stay in, like, in the understanding of, of the Holy Roman Pontiff, right? You don't think the chair is just like empty and never going to be filled or something. I'm not, not advocating for the set of a pontism. And in fact, I'm, you know, I, I, I sympathize because I understand like, what it feels like to be hurt by by the papacy but also like come on like it's much easier just to be like yeah kind of open it just kind of sucks <laughs> um so i don't know you know there's there's such a beauty and i i know how difficult it is to leave something like didas and go to society not just by time but also just by mentality and and to kind of go through those steps but 
this is kind of the way that we just have to be until until the church uh with our lady's help stops its identity crisis because mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing right now yeah no i agree 100 percent to piggyback off your thought on St. Thomas more and like the limits of obedience. That's actually a perfect segue into what we're talking about um, with. So where we left off on our discussion of Marcel Lefebvre was who is he kind of the challenges he made up against the council, as well as uh, we kind of ended on this note of the consecrations. Cause I mean, really when it comes down to it, I don't even think that most Catholics per se, even, well, let me put it this way. Most traditional Catholics, I would say, probably don't even care that he had big qualms with specific areas of the Second Vatican Council. I think where most mm -hmm. traditional Catholics who are not involved with the SSPX really jump off the, the Lefebvre bandwagon, if you will, is the consecrations. Is Was it justifiable? I've had talks with dozens of perspectives where people say, you know, um, you know, it wasn't justifiable. Maybe if you would have just waited a little longer, you know, then, then it would have been yep. okay. Um, you know, well, we have the, you know, even just really just the whole war between, I mean, it's an unfortunate war. It shouldn't really happen, but, you know, two brothers squabbling between the fraternity and the society, um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the fraternity saying, well, we have all the things that we have over here. There's the society responding, well, you don't have bishops. So it didn't really work out for you that whole war. And so what I'm kind of wanting to look at with you guys is, really the consecrations tonight but before we do so let's take a little bit of a let's make a timeline if we will so the council ends in 1965 right john the 23rd opens it in 1962 and it's very clear from the opening address that his desire is to open up the doors and the windows of, to the world um and there's a certain goodness in it and i'm putting this in with a huge asterisk on it um because on the one hand prior to the council the church had uh, essentially yeah, been battling modern philosophy since the Protestant Revolution all the way until mm -hmm. the time of the council. And um, Timothy S. Flanders has a great series on the council where he does talk about the kind of the good response that the church was making in really just, I guess, imposing scholastic Thomism as the system of thought on the church, especially Pius X hunting down the modernists. Great stuff. Uh, needs to be done today. We need a second inquisition <laughs> for real right now. Yeah. Uh, it, it's bad out there, you know? And, but so, but the problem with this is though, is scholasticism put into the hands of the untrained becomes a bad weapon. And so what kind of happens before the council is people aren't reading Thomas along with the great commentator tradition, but rather they're just saying things like, Oh, you're, you know, oh, you're not a Thomist. You're a, you're a Bonaventurian. Well, you're not a Catholic. And so it would be basically these really ill-formed seminarians and seminary trainings that really was just kind of boggling down. You obviously had the whole issue with the manualist tradition at the time where the manuals, though they were good, and I, and I don't think that they were bad, um, mm -hmm. theology pretty much just came to be where, yeah, you just showed up at seminary, a guy pulled out basically a manual and was just like, here's what we believe, da 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 da, da. There was no mm -hmm. for, like, let's investigate this further, essentially being like yeah. Thomas and saying, let's dig into this, let's look at scripture, let's compare this, let's understand this. And so with that climate of kind of just static noise, if you will, um, rises the nouvelle theologie, the, you know, which is uh, a mixture of certain elements which people we can commend people who desire to understand scripture and understand the fathers mm -hmm. which are good but it's the movement is hijacked very early on and essentially it is the rebirth of neo-modernism which um, is well you know let's not just go back to scripture and tradition let's also try to square modern anti-christian philosophies like Hegelianism, Kantianism, Rousseau, Locke, all these Enlightenment thinkers. Mm -hmm. Let's synthesize this with Catholic thought. And so when the council opens up, you have this force come in highly organized. They come into the council and they just wreak havoc. And it's a battle. And what's funny is you can read good books, a couple of good books I'd recommend. I'll put links in the description for everyone is the first book is 
the old title of it is uh, it's called uh, the Rhine flowing into the Tiber. It's, it's a book written by mm. a liberal priest who's sympathetic with the council, but uh, pretty much affirms what the society of St. Pius X is saying that, yeah, liberals hijacked a lot of things, as well as the book Inside Vatican II by Professor Roberto de Matei. It's kind of a more conservative take on it. But both agree mm-hmm. that essentially when you had the council open up, you had people like Cardinal Ottaviani and Archbishop Lefebvre. They created all these schemata, all these kind of preparatory documents for years. And it, you can go back and read these things. These are really good doctrines, uh, doctrinal works. Um, but then they were all tossed except for the document on the liturgy, which was Bunini's uh, kind of um, <laughs> ill child. Magnum opus. Yeah, his magnum <laughs> opus of, of death <laughs> and sewage. Um, and, <laughs> um, and, and so what happens is um, they go, the liberals go in, they're highly organized, and they just, within two weeks, toss all of the schemata. And a lot of scholars have talked about that this is one of the great areas of rupture that you find is because it wasn't, well, let's just tweak the schemata and let's just, yeah. you know, this is our kind of rough draft. Let's keep working on it, things like that, like a normal document would. But rather, they just toss it all and begin from scratch. And Lefebvre is sitting there essentially kind of bewildered because the conservatives aren't organized. And they're just, they kind of come in like Lefebvre again, he comes out of the bush of Africa. He's been preaching. He shows back up and he's like, what the heck's going on? Um, (laughs) And so it goes into chaos mode. And so it's not even until I think the second session where they actually, he organizes the Cetus Internalis Patrum, the Council of Fathers. So this is the kind of a block of around 200 or so conservative and traditionalist minded bishops. Good notes for the audience, by the way, people that are not among this group of good traditionalist bishops that most Catholics would consider conservative would be people like Cardinal Wotiva, John Paul II. Cardinal Wotiva was Mm -hmm. very much so with the French liberal bishops at the council. Um, Cardinal Ratzinger, right? He was, he wasn't wasn't even a cardinal or a bishop at the time, but he was a pretis, right? He was an expert that really put in a lot of his things. Neither of these two gentlemen were part of this because uh, again, they had kind of grown up in this kind of stagnant, I would say um, false Thomism, if you will, Mm -hmm. false classicism where uh, there's not any room to really understand anything in any other depth. And so they push a lot of these documents through. And the document that I'd really want to focus in on tonight as we discuss is the document Dignitatis Humanae on Religious Liberty. Highly debated, uh, highly debated because on the one hand, you read paragraph number one, right? And it clearly states that the traditional Catholic, I mean, literally even uses the term traditional Catholic in it. Uh, traditional Catholic doctrine is maintained and retained in the document. Whereas when you jump to paragraph two, all heck breaks. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And Mm -hmm. what's interesting, side note, by the way, is that paragraph number one is actually written by Marcel Lefebvre and actually put into the document at the very end of the vote. So that's one historical tidbit we have to write. I didn't know that. Wow. I'm going to have to go back and read that. Yeah. (laughs) What's what's funny is one of the reasons why the Vatican II documents sound so schizophrenic is because the Chetos is basically doing damage control. So all the really good orthodox sounding statements are coming from Marcel Lefebvre. So and any, only after the fact. Yeah, only after the fact. So honestly, if you want to be completely honest, that the only way that you can square a good chunk of Vatican II with the tradition is because of Marcel Lefebvre, which is the funniest thing. <laughs> <laughs> because it was his group that are basically doing damage control, being like, no, 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 no we'll do this. And Again, they couldn't really pass anything, like any of their own documents, but they could at least amend the documents enough. Yeah, yeah. So the council ends, right? And this is kind of where we're going to start. Council ends, and the reforms are being pushed out by Paul VI. And, uh, you know, Archbishop Lefebvre, he retires from the Holy Ghost Fathers because he recognizes the order and the essentially the rules coming down from Rome are just so liberal. I can't do this. I'm already super old. I, I'm just going to go retire, mm-hmm. pray, and mm-hmm. essentially uh, fulfill the dream of St. Jean Vianney, who just wanted to run away from yeah. parish life and become a monk. And mm-hmm. what happens is he gets a knock on the door by nine seminarians, right, uh, including the future Bishop de Sile Madre, who's my favorite of the Society Bishops. If you've never read his philosophy, please do. It's incredibly based um it's so good um but 
he he knocks on the door and essentially they basically say look the diocesan seminarians uh and seminary itself the structure it's not working out they're teaching us all mm. this modern stuff lefebvre says well i could send you to freeburg there's still some conservative stuff there so he sends them there still pretty bad so they come back and they're like no will you please train us and so he opens up a first year of formation which eventually turns into a full-on international seminary in econ switzerland and it's fully legal it's fully within the canonical structures of the okay. church approved by the bishop approved by the pope and it's the only seminary in, in the world that's training priests for the tridentine mass right that's one thing that Again, traditional Catholics coming into the Latin Mass for the first time, right? Whether it's in any of these groups, most mm -hmm. of it in the diocesan, you have to understand that from, yeah, at least 1970 to 1988, there were no Latin Mass groups aside from the Society of St. Pius X. Or can, affiliate. I, can I make a, like, let me make a quick, just a, a little quick historical aside, because I think your audience would love this. Mm -hmm. There's a documentary put out by NBC called The New American Catholic mm -hmm. yeah, it's in 1968. Um, I, you can find it on YouTube. Just type in New American Catholic NBC. It's, it's an hour long. And for people who, who, you know, people always ask, like, you know, there's this movement now, and I'm sure we'll get into it, like, Going back to the document, because clearly that just went off the rails, but mm -hmm. this is only three years after the council. So you can actually, you were listening actually to the bishops who were there mm -hmm. and the priests who were like interested and they open up all sorts of topics. You can, you can see the seeds, especially as far as America was concerned, why a lot of the, the destruction happened as it happened in the States. Um, and I think that would be just a good historical footnote because, because it's not 1970 yet, the Novus Ordo Missae of Paul the Sixth mm -hmm. is not there. We're looking at the quasi in between mass, right? Mm -hmm. The the mm -hmm. guitars with the Latin, mm -hmm. and are we versus populum? Are we at Oriental? I mean, it's it's a it's a freaking train wreck. Um, so I would I just want to say to your audience, the New American Catholic by NBC is one of the greatest historical finds. Uh, if you want to kind of understand the mess that that came back very quickly after the council. No, thank yeah. you for that. No, that's it. I've seen that. It's an it's it's very insightful. And you're you're so right. I remember um as I've been going through my uh I guess novitiate for the third order Dominicans, one thing I remember having to read was basically the history of the Dominican right. And when you get to 1962, when they toss it, right, and they start to adopt the Nova Sordo in 1965, they essentially from 1965 to 1970 are just doing ad experimentum the entire time. They don't even know what the heck they're doing. They're, I mean, mm -hmm. so like you have these conservative priests who are like, well, why don't we just continue doing Latin? And everyone else is just like, I mean, get with the times. We don't do this anymore. And it's just a freak show. It turns into a complete freak show. And so, I mean, but this happens universally. And so eventually, right, they just throw up their hands and like, we'll just adopt the Nova Sordo. And which is so sad yeah. because that's why the Dominican order lost its pizzazz it's almost like part of its deep charism because it just tossed it <laughs> completely mm -hmm. tossed. so you see you see in 1970 right the society of st Pius the 10th starts it's completely legit completely good but one thing that happens really early on is that archbishop lefebvre would send his priests to different dioceses um whenever the new mass first came out right so archbishop mm -hmm. lefebvre had practiced the 65 missile a few times and was just like Mm, this is not it chief that's my translation but like this is just not going to work out and he actually specifically did say which is really interesting that it was he could tell it was damaging his faith in different areas really early on mm. and so right the new mass is coming out he releases along with cardinal taviani the famous otaviani intervention but when the new mass mm. comes out he sends his priest to go and look kind of like, okay, scope it out for me, tell me what's going on. So they bring in information, they bring in these missiles, they bring in what's going on. And he recognizes really quickly that the new mass is nothing more than a neo-Protestant and neo-modernist takeover of the Roman Rite, and that it's dangerous for souls. Um, and knowing enough Thomas, he knows that, again, right, it can be the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, but still illicit, because according to Thomas's treatise on sacrifice, it's not what you're offering to God, but why you're offering it to God. So if you're offering mm. it to God for a neo-modernist or neo-Protestant reason, or at least not a sufficiently Catholic reason, then that won't be um, acceptable in heaven's eyes. So he says, no, we're going to just continue saying the 1962 missile. Well, so as that time goes on, the French bishops, they realize really quickly 
okay, we're having this threat from this one soul seminary who's only training priests for the Tridentine Mass. And so Rome sends the famous two inquisitors, uh, really, they're just papal uh, investigators, if you will, observers. Papal legates. Yeah, papal legates, right? To go and look at the society seminary in Econ. And, you know, according to the report and everybody I've ever heard that's talked about it, um, they say, yeah, they liked everything. They thought everything was great. The only thing they didn't partake in, though, was the mass. And so when they left, Archbishop Lefebvre seminarians were scandalized because these um, envoys of the Pope had basically um, been t spreading all kinds of liberal phony heresy around saying things like, well, you know, eventually married priests, that's just a given. That's just what's going to happen. But the most scandalous mm -hmm. thing being, well, you know, we can probably doubt the physical resurrection of our Lord because, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it, I mean, and this again goes back to, to classic modernism. They're like, well, it's not a historical Christ fact. Rather, right. it's just Christ rose he again rose in, all in our hearts. hearts. Yeah. And Archbishop Lefebvre is understandably and <laughs> rightly and justly and saintly sane and recognizes this is wrong. And so he publicizes his famous 1974 declaration. And for those of you guys who do watch my show often or even just have gone and read the about page about me, I profess this declaration of faith as well. Um, this is definitely part of the show. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to go over this and I want to kind of get your guys' thoughts as we go through this. And we'll just uh, we'll see how much ground we cover. So, all right. So here's the document. I'm just going to read over it really quickly. And then after that, I just want your guys' take on, on what stood out to you. Mm -hmm. What historical things would you like to input? So the archbishop, right, he sends this out to pretty much everyone in the world. And he says, we hold fast with all our heart and with all our soul to Catholic Rome, guardian of the Catholic faith, and to the end of the traditions necessary to preserve this faith, to eternal Rome, mistress of all wisdom and truth. We refuse, on the, on, on the other hand, and have always refused to follow the neo-modernist and neo-Protestant tendencies, which are clearly evident in the Second Vatican Council and after the Council, in all the reforms which issue from it. All these reforms indeed have contributed and are still contributing to the destruction of the church, to the ruin of the priesthood, to the abolition of the sacrifice and the mass, to the sacraments, and to the, to the disappearance of religious life, to a naturalist and Telhardian teaching of universities, seminaries, and catechetics, a teaching derived from liberalism and Protestantism many times condemned by the solemn magisterium of the church. No authority, not even in the highest in the hierarchy, can force us to abandon or diminish our Catholic faith, so clearly expressed and professed by the church's magisterium for 19 centuries. But though we, says St. Paul, or an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. It is not uh, it is not this that the Holy Father, is it not this the Holy Father is repeating to us today? And if we can discern a certain contradiction in his words and deeds, as well as in those of the dicasteries, well, we choose what was always taught, and we turn a deaf ear to the novelties destroying the church. It is impossible to modify the Lex Arandi without modifying the Lex Credendi. To the Novus Ordo Mise corresponds a new catechism, a new priesthood, a new, semin new seminaries, a charismatic Pentecostal church, all things opposed to orthodoxy and the perennial teaching of the church. This reformation born of liberalism and modernism is poisoned through and through. It derives from heresy and ends in heresy, even if all its acts are not formally heretical. It is therefore impossible for any conscientious and faithful Catholic to espouse this reformation or to submit to it in any way whatsoever. The only attitude of faithfulness to the, to the church and to Catholic doctrine in view of our salvation is a categorical refusal to accept this reformation. This is why, without any spirit of rebellion, bitterness, or resentment, we pursue our, pursue our work of forming priests with the timeless magisterium as our guide. We, we are persuaded that we can render no greater service to the Holy Catholic Church and to the sovereign pontiff and to posterity. That is why we hold fast to all that has been believed and practiced in the church, morals, liturgy, teaching of the catechism, formation of priests, and institution of the church. By the church of all time, to all these uh, things as codified by the books which we saw, which saw the light of day before the modernist influence in the council. This we shall do until such time as the true light of tradition dissipates the darkness obscuring by the sky of eternal Rome. By doing this with the grace of God and with the help of the Blessed Virgin Mary and that of St. Joseph and St. Pius X, we are assured of remaining faithful to the Catholic Church and to all the successors of Peter and being the Fidelis Dispensori, Mysterium Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, in Spiritus Sancto, 
Amen. So he releases this right in November of 1974. And to be honest, uh, I could say a whole lot about this, but I'm going to really let you guys have it. The only thing I really have to say about it is it seems so pertinent even to our day, even though it was written so long ago. <laughs> Rudy, you can have a four. I for think us. so too. Um, you know, one of the things that's so surprising to to read in this document is the amount of foresight that the Archbishop had in seeing the destruction that inevitably was to come from all of these reforms from the council. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think that one day, and I, I pray that this happens in my lifetime, that he will be canonized as a saint, mm -hmm. as, uh, as a defender of the, of the faith, because he foresaw all of these things leading to the destruction of faith. I mean, we can talk about the statistics. We talk about the statistics all the time, 70%, mm -hmm. perhaps even more now, since this, uh, this Pew Research, uh, poll was taken, uh, quite a while ago, it might even be more, but almost 70%, maybe even more people don't believe in the real presence of, 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 of Christ in the Eucharist. That's, that's a massive departure from, from what he, he knew. There's another document too, that he wrote and he discusses, I believe this is in his book, I accuse the council in which he describes his the way that he had been taught the way that he had been doing things for almost all of his life before trying to retire all of a sudden being turned on its head and becoming something that you know for him almost becoming a pariah you know the things that 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 spread the faith all over africa all of all through his uh, his time there in the latin mass the teachings of the church perennial teachings that had been, you know, timeless up until that point. So it's very interesting to see, uh, to see his, his outlook, right. But also to, to realize that the things that he was defending, the things that, that he considers to be eternal Rome, mm -hmm. those things were being turned on its head because of the reforms and because of the council, this is really an unprecedented takeover of the faith. So I think it's, it's really, it's really, I think he's really hitting the nail on the head here. And I, I, it's this, this document is something that resonates to us today because we're seeing it, it rise its ugly head. This, this never went away. This is partially why Tradiciones Custodes happened. It's because they, when I, when I say they, I, I say it with the modernists in Rome saw the Latin mass resurging. They see how packed the parishes are. They see what they are teaching. And it is a contradiction to the status quo that we see in the Novus Ordo world, uh, just generally speaking, in the church, you see that it is a contradiction. And so this document is still pertinent to us today. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Whew. And likewise, Rudy, I mean, everything you said is just complete agreement and a thousand times more. Um, we talk a lot about a tale of two churches. Mm -hmm. And I had to kind of look this up quickly, but... Archbishop Lefebvre wrote an open letter to confuse Catholics in 1968. He writes this in 1974. So if open letter comes out three years after the council, in, in a short amount of time, the world turned upside down. And it's interesting for people because anyone who knows anything about what it takes to build a legacy knows that it takes you decades to, to build something and it takes you minutes, hours, take your pick of whatever fragment of time to lose everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, they, they, there's an old, uh, I think it's a General Zavorov quote, right? Which is that um, uh, battles are decided in minutes and the fates of empires are decided in hours. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's that decisive. In a very short amount of time in the history of the, of the 2000 year history of the church, things, <laughs> things went crazy. It's, it's not, and it wasn't up for debate or discussion. And that's perhaps one of the most shocking things. That's how you know that there was a demonic smoke of Satan that entered the church. Mm -hmm. Because as you see with this document, as you see with open letters, you see with the life of Lefebvre and the great suffering of watching the church that he loved, the church that he fought for, that he evangelized for, suddenly he came back home and everything that he'd been taught to defend is true wasn't there anymore. It was new. And even in this document, it's, it's amazing to me seeing the words new written decades before I was even born because how many times did we grow up and we heard the new evangelization? We heard 
uh, it's a you know we heard uh, the the new springtime right we heard this new this and this new that the new mass new music a new way of thinking and loving God all this kind of stuff the novel theology the new theology and all these times beg the question what was wrong with the old mm -hmm. was it a fact that the old was just tarnished and need to be polished off at the Reformation or was it the fact that the old was so actually uh, poor in the eyes of the God and apparently in the eyes of, of, of the, the, cler the clergy mm -hmm. that it just needed to be done away with in such a short amount of time. So it breaks my heart because, you know, we do see this rupture still. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful and I think we're all grateful that we are living here in the 21st century than suffering through at our, this age now in, in the 20th. And one thing, as I close this thought, it's like, we don't know just how many people were so scandalized. We read these stories, these horror stories. We make it a priority to try to gather the news of the time and, and Catholics who lived onward after this, these changes because so much confusion reigned that so many people lost their faith. In, in the span of a decade, priests walked away, nuns walked away, laity walked away, bishops even walked away. They couldn't do it anymore. There was the rise of the you know, set of a contism. So the chair of St. Peter must be empty because there's no way that the Holy Roman Pontiff would ever do something like this. Mm -hmm. um, we, we didn't see as great of a rush of the embrace of Eastern Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy as maybe we're seeing nowadays. But I mean, they fled the ship. A lot of people not based upon their own you know, private desires, you know, the, the impulses of their appetites, but because they would go to mass and they would look up at the crucifix and I would say they'd gaze at the tabernacle, but the tabernacle had been moved away, you mm -hmm. know, and instead of the altar, a Bugnini box had been placed out in front of them. And instead of sacred music that their ancestors had sang for centuries, they now got tambourines and sang to the mountains and sang to the sea and mm -hmm. pretended that St. Francis, all he ever did was hug animals. And so, mm -hmm. you know, more that I read about Archbishop Lefebvre, the more that I really try to understand and, and have real sympathy for a lot of different people that went through these things, the more I'm realizing, you know, here's a man here who, loves the church first and foremost. He, um, he's clearly submitting his will, his intellect, his heart to the eternal Rome. He's not, he's not a man of rupture. He's not a man of schism. He's a man of obedience and understanding that obedience means it's not to a man, you know, it's to the office and it's ultimately to Christ who still who gives us these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's it's an obedience to the deposit of faith. And to even piggyback on what you said, yeah, here's the book, Open Letter to Confused Catholics. If you guys haven't read this book, please read this book. This is, I mean, it, you can it, even get a PDF. Of it. You don't even have to buy the book. Just PDF yeah. that thing. Yeah, you can get a PDF. You can get there. Angelus Press has done an audio book for free on YouTube and on uh, Spotify. You can listen to the mm. entire book read if you prefer it that way. It's super easy. And it's, I think it's the perfect introduction book. Uh, again, I, like I said, last episode, I thought it was kind of like Lefebvre reading my mail, if you will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think your analogy is really good. Uh, an analogy that kind of comes to mind is it's like a soldier who's gone off to war, right? Fighting the enemy and saving people like villagers who are being attacked by evil groups of men. And then the husband comes back home and then he finds what is his wife doing? Well, she has all these men that she's hanging out around with who don't have her interest in best mind. And then when he says something against it, everyone's just like, well, you just seem so, you know, stuck in the past, if you will. That's kind yeah. of essentially what happens. So when mm -hmm. he publishes this document in 1974, um, obviously it's not met with hurrah, huzzah, the archbishop. No, it's complete firestorm. And Paul VI just blasts him and yeah. this is the first time i believe in 200 years where a pope comes out in public condemns someone an archbishop by name so this is already revolutionary uh the archbishop lefebvre has gone from yeah apostolic nuncio personal friend of Pius the 12th to now being called out by the holy roman pontiff himself and you also as you mentioned jordan have all these ridiculous things going on like Setic of Antism, I believe, is like the, um, it's the other coin, if you will, of what you see the ultramontane spirit of the Novites, yeah. today, because on the one hand, like the Novites are like everything the Pope says, you must obey. And the set of contest are like, yes, but a Pope can never say heretical things. And so therefore, since he can never say something that's wrong, he must not be the Pope. Um, mm. And so all this confusion is going on. Well, as time goes on, Vatican says, shut down the seminary. 
et cetera, et cetera. Archbishop Fleb says, no, we can't shut down ceremony because of, of ultimately our obedience is to the deposit of faith. And again, a link in the bottom, if you go read Aquinas' treatise on obedience, very clearly, a, a or even just on you know fraternal correction, a, a, a lesser prelate can correct a superior if the faith is in danger. That's the big key. And the faith, yeah, it was so visual then. I mean, literally everywhere going insane. He's like, we have to. So as time goes on, what happens is, you know, Paul VI, he passes away, and John Paul II, right, he comes in after the very brief stint of John Paul I, and uh, mm -hmm. John Paul I, right, uh, he pretty much gets nothing done aside from kind of just maintaining the status quo, if you will, and then John Paul II enters in, and a lot of the world thinks, okay, well, this is very different. Number one, he's a non-Italian pope, so that's mm -hmm. kind of cool, and at the same time, you also have uh, this pope that's coming from a conservative country. So maybe he's able to kind of like Bridges bottle, gaps. so to speak. Yeah, bottle like the insanity that's going on right now. But if anything, you know, the insanity just kind of gets cranked up to 12 um, with things that come out. Because while John Paul II is really good when it comes to certain social issues, um, like homosexuality, uh, right? A sin that cries against heaven, something that most mm. Catholics have forgotten, <laughs> um, or abortion. Um, he's really weak when it comes to the doctrine of ecumenism, of a proper ecumenism. And so what I'm wanting us to do now is kind of shift our discussion. So in 1986, right, we're going to make this jump. In 1986, the famous Assisi meetings take place. And, and for those of you guys who don't know, Assisi is essentially... Um, was a massive ecumenical prayer service invoked by John Paul II in order to pray for peace. And it caused much, much scandal in the Catholic world. Assisi is also kind of- It was by like, grace of God, the internet didn't exist back then. Yeah, for real, for <laughs> real. Know, like... But you know, one thing that's interesting about Assisi, Assisi is kind of like a bad remake. It, it ended up turning into kind of like a bad remake film because there's Assisi 1, and then later on, there's a CC2 and a CC3. Um, and so it became a, a really evil trinity, if you will, of bad stuff being promulgated. And so what happens with the CC is all the religions of the world come together and they invoke their gods, which, right, St. Paul, just echoing the, the, the King David, right, is all the gods of the nations mm -hmm. are devils, right? This is, again, you read the church fathers, they're not like, oh, yeah, you know, this is just a less truer form but we can all kind of get together and sing Kumbaya, right? All the church fathers, all the scholastics. I mean, Thomas Aquinas even says that, yeah, if you were to worship at the tomb of Muhammad, you're an apostate. Um, and so like um, all the- I thought that we worshiped the same God. Yeah, exactly. Nick. I thought we all worshiped the one God together. Um, <laughs> and so, and obviously you guys know the stuff about like, they put a Buddha statue on top of the tabernacle. They give churches to these different groups. I mean, they even have snake worshipers there. I mean, how, how blatantly satanic do you get than that? You know what I'm saying? Literally worshiping a, a crawling animal. And I guess maybe the philosophy major in me, aside from it, just being a sin is just like, man, this is just so cringe. I'm like, it's literally just an animal. Like what the heck? Um, <laughs> but, it's the 20th century. Get with it. We don't yeah, I'm just animals. like, why are we taking this stuff seriously? I mean, this is why atheists think religion is bunk because you actually like align with this stuff. So this mm. causes great scandal and indifference. And so Archbishop Lefebvre comes out with his starking rebuke, right? Joined by his friend from the council, who was also in the Chetus Internalis Patrum, Bishop de Castro Meyer, who formed the, uh, I believe it's called the Fraternity or the Association of the Priests of St. Jean Vianney, which were a group of mm -hmm. um, priests over in Campos. And unfortunately, they've kind of, uh, today, they're not really that good anymore, because though they still say the Latin Mass, their superiors say the New Mass all the time. So they definitely don't have any of their patrimony of their mm. founder. So listen to his rebuke. And let me know what you guys think. Because again, I, I agree with what he says. He says, uh, starting here, he says, Rome has asked us if we have the intention of proclaiming our rupture with the Vatican on the occasion of the Congress of Assisi. We think that this question should rather be as the following. Quote, do you believe and do you have the intention of proclaiming that the Congress of Assisi consummates a rupture with the Roman authorities with the Catholic Church? For this, uh, for this is the question which preoccupies those who still remain Catholic. Indeed, it is clear that since the Second Vatican Council, the Pope and the bishops are making more and more uh, of a clear departure from our predecessors. Everything that has been put into place 
by the church in past centuries to defend the faith and everything that was done by the missionaries to spread it, so Lefebvre himself, even to the point of martyrdom, henceforth is considered to be a fault which the church must confess and ask pardon for. The attitude of the 11 popes who, from 1789 up until 1958, condemned the liberal revolution in its official documents is considered as, quote, a lack of understanding of the Christian spirit that inspired the revolution, end quote. Hence, the complete about face since the Second Vatican Council, which makes us repeat the words of our Lord, who, uh, who came to those who came to his arrest, quote, this is your hour and the, and the power of darkness. Adopting the liberal religion of Protestantism and the revolution, the naturalistic principles of Jacques Rousseau, the atheistic liberties of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, the principles of human, uh, of human dignity no longer have any relation with the truth and moral dignity of the Roman authorities, turn their back on their predecessors and break with the Catholic Church. And they themselves at the service of the destroyers of Christianity and of the universal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. The present act of John Paul II and the National Episcopate illustrates year by year this radical change in the conception of the faith and the church uh, and the priesthood and the world and salvation by grace. This high point is this rupture with the previous magisterium of the church took place at Assisi after the visits uh, after the visit to the synagogue, the public sin against the one true God against the incarnate word and his church makes us shudder with horror. John Paul II encourages false religions to pray to their false gods and act immeasurable, unprecedented scandal. We must recall here our declaration of 1974, which remains more relevant than ever for us remains indefectibly attached to the Roman, uh, to the Catholic and Roman church of all times, we are obliged to take note that this modernist and liberal religion of modern and conciliar Rome is always distancing itself more and more from us who profess the Catholic faith of the 11 popes who condemned this false religion. The rupture does not come from us, but from Paul VI and John Paul II who break with their predecessors. This denial of the whole past of the church by these two popes and the bishops who uh, in, uh, imitate them is an inconceivable impiety for those who remain Catholic in fidelity to the 20 centuries of the same faith. Thus, we consider as null everything inspired by the spirit of denial of the past, all the post-conciliar reforms, and all acts of the Roman uh, of Rome accomplished in this impiety. We count on the grace of God and the support of the Virgin Most Faithful, are the, all the martyrs and all the popes right up to the council, and all the holy founders and foundresses of the contemplative and missionary orders to come to our aid in the renewal of the church through the integral fidelity, true tradition, Archbishop Lefebvre, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So again, he throws down the gauntlet and he's not wrong because again, you look up for instance in even just your basic catechism of, the, of Pope St. Pius X, what is a sin against faith by partaking in non-Christian religion? Now you can say, well, John Paul II didn't, you know, he didn't partake in what they did. Well, he allowed it, right? We have such a thing as sin of omission and sin of commission, right? Yes. Um, and so it's like, don't get around it. That's it's a, it's a terrible thing. So yeah. What are, what are your guys' thoughts on the statement? I don't know. Is this the first time you guys have ever heard this statement before? I've, I've seen the statement before. Um, and I, I think it's proper to say that that, that was a massive departure. Uh, and I like that he turns it around because the things that we are accused of even today as traditionalists is that we, we deny or we separate ourselves. But really, the people who are separating themselves are the modernists, the people who, who do things like this. And I feel sorry to have to say that, you know, John Paul II and Paul VI, but mostly John Paul II, because he, you know, there's evidence of him doing this, mm -hmm. um, really made a, a big departure. One of the things that's so scandalous about this particular Assisi meeting, I believe it was Assisi II, wherein they, they put the statue of Buddha, Buddha on top of uh, the tabernacle. And I, I, I have to hope that perhaps our blessed Lord was not in the tabernacle at the time. I, I, I really wish. But either way, it doesn't matter because the tabernacle represents the, the, the Christ present in the church. And for them to place something on top of that is so, so scandalous. Now, the other thing that, that is really scandalous is this is the Supreme Pontiff. This mm -hmm. is the Vicar of Christ. This is, the, this is like the most supreme authority on earth. And what he's doing is he is 
instead of being elevated from all of these false religions, he instead, and this is, this is like the, uh, I want to say this is like a cardinal sin of bad optics that we continually see today. The cardinal sin of bad optics is that he puts himself in the same position as they are, as if he is just one of them, Mm-hmm. And he is throwing away the majesty of the office. He's throwing away, essentially, to to the observer, the 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 key thing that puts him as something different and other and above all of these false religions. So that that to me is is reason enough for for us to to say no, you know, and, and to agree and to to just say perhaps. You know, because people people lobby all, all, all these letters and, and and the writings of Archbishop Lefebvre, and they say, "Oh, look, he's so he's so you know contradictory. He's so uh, he's trying to be something else. He's he's being mean. He's doing he's doing all of these things." But just look at look at what he's reacting to, and and when you understand that uh, uh, an observer seeing this is really going to take away something awful. You know, you have to realize that the position he's taking is the right position to take. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. I can't agree more. Yeah, I mean that's all completely true. Um, man, it's it just <laughs> a couple of things come to mind. First off, I'm 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 always reminded of something very immediate to me. Jen and I wrote our parish priest recently because my cousins are getting married in New Mexico, mm-hmm. and they're not getting married. Well, again, like I'm going to use common phrase instead of having to explain every asterisk of what I'm about to say, but they're not getting (laughs) married in the Catholic church. I don't know even if they're having a Christian ceremony. Okay. So, uh, so for colloquial terms, I use wedding, but obviously asterisks, right? So anyway, as we wrote to our parish priest, we said, Hey, listen, on one hand, like, we don't want to participate in the idea of scandal. Like, do we, we don't want to give assent to something which isn't really happening. We don't want to give assent to a marriage that's, that's not, that's not in the church. On the other hand, what if we just attended the reception? What does that actually mean? Like, what if it's like a family gathering kind of thing? And our priest wrote back and said, you know, essentially, he was very, very clear. He was like, um, even the attendance of the reception would give you seemingly assent and confirmation to that you approve of this marriage, which isn't even in his words. He was like, this isn't even a natural marriage. Because as a Catholic, there are certain obligations that you have to have. Mm-hmm. And when you abandon your faith, you know, if you abstain and you don't, it's not like a formal declaration, just don't do it. You're actually witnessing mortal sin. These people are going to be cohabitating together. They're not in a sacramental, not in a natural marriage. And as a result, like that's going to cause, you are, you are assenting to a wellspring of sin. Mm-hmm. Um, and we said, okay, well, that sucks because our modern era thinks about people's feelings all the time. But mm-hmm. you know what? Like that makes a lot of sense. Christ said that, you know, he came not to bring peace to the world, but a sword and that it will be brother against brother and, and mother and father. And you must hate your father and mother to follow me. And this is a cousin. And it's not that we hate them, of course, but this gives a sense to such a thing. Um, so if that's how my parish priest reacted mm-hmm. to a sin that, you know, how much more scandalous is it? For the Supreme Pontiff, not to meet with other religions, not to say hello, right, not to have a photo op, but to worship and at previous occasions seemingly worship or give assent to falsehoods, to paganisms, to to potential demons. I, I'm not making a judgment on the state of John Paul II's soul. I'm one of those Catholics whom, if the church declares a saint, I think it's just easy just to kind of go, all right, and then like, you know, move on and focus on my boys and pray for the cultists of like Leo XIII. Um, but what I am saying is, if the Catholic Church is true, and not just one of many truths, if the Catholic Church is the fullness of the truth, why would you want to even give semblance, credence to falsehoods, not the falsehoods of degrees, right? We're not talking about schism- schismatics like we do with the Orthodox, right? Where it's like, okay, like I can see how these are clearly separated brethren, mm-hmm. and w- the fullness of the church can be easy. But we're talking about shaman, we're mm-hmm. talking about Buddhists, we're talking about Hindus. And this is in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. These degrees of truth are highly dangerous because what we have essentially given assent to is that one can remain a Muslim, one can remain, uh, remain a Buddhist, one can remain an Indian shaman. And these things are meritorial, they're good to God. And this, of course, this wound hasn't gone away. Lefebvre, it, it should make us very mad when we read things that 
our ancestors read mm -hmm. and they feel like they were written yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, when Holy Father Pope Francis has a Pachamama idol brought to St. Peter's and, had, and people prostrate themselves before it, that's paganism. That's a sin against the first commandment. And not some ethereal way like, oh, I worship money instead of God. Like that's a real serious sin against the first commandment. When you build an ecumenical um, settlement dedicated to the great three Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, yeah. Judaism, and Islam, that is a sin against the first commandment. Mm -hmm. I know we have a whole squabble with the Jews and obviously, but let's talk about the Mohammedans for a second. Mm -hmm. Allah, as they envision him in his mind's eye, does not exist. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's not a triune God, he does not exist. This is a, this is a great heresy. And mm -hmm. if we give assent to these kind of things, then why would I ever go to the one true church? The church doesn't even believe itself to be the one true church. So why would I follow it? You know, <laughs> so it, it, it breaks my, it makes it, it makes me sad is what it, it overwhelmingly does. It makes me sad. And we're fortunate in a way because <sighs> we in different forms have the Latin mass and we have access to Lefebvre's documents. My parents are fortunate in a way because my parents were both in their 20s when, or second to CC, they were in their 30s, right? Um, but they didn't hear about this. And I think that that was a great mercy because this was a huge scandal, but there are a lot of Catholics who didn't even understand what it meant. And maybe that was a great protection of the Holy Spirit. Because if that happened today, I mean, we already saw what Pachamama did. Mm -hmm. um, if this happened today, and we have popes kissing Korans and placing, we do, and placing Buddhas on, on tabernacles and stuff. Again, it is by grace of God that we've been shielded from these things. But I, I hope that people understand more and more that the scandals, the damages that happened to the church, it's not just because we were goody two shoes and then the devil just attacked we really opened ourselves up for a great chastisement yeah. and we ought to pray acts of reparation. We ought to try to make amends as best we can. We ought to live our lives so that us and our children never go through something like this, which is mm -hmm. obvious and blatant sins against the first commandment. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's one of those things where there's really not an excuse anymore when people try to make like they try to justify this. I mean, for instance, like you said, Jordan, they will say like, oh, well, there's degrees of truth. But again, you read the documents, like read Nostra Aetate on other religions, mm -hmm. read Aetatis Humanae on religious liberty, and uh, or even the document on ecumenism. And you'll find that this language is like nine to one um, positives of other religions. And then like one little sentence at the end being like, well, Catholicism is the fullness of faith and this, they lack in this right. And it, it doesn't help, but then when you take this and you put it on television, um, people aren't going to go back and like look for that one line, you know, and say and try to get. Right. It's like we're looking for literally one line to be like the one line that saves this entire ship from going down. Yeah, how are those baptisms working for the Amazon post Amazon Synod? Oh, it must be a wellspring <laughs> right now, right? That one bishop that bragged that he'd never baptized anyone and never converted anyone in his life. The entire life. time he was there. <laughs> right, right, you know, it's getting these knocks. You know, oh, well, thank God, Father, or Your Excellency. You know, I never knew anything about the Catholic faith until uh, you placed one of my idols in, in St. Peter's, and now I want to come to the fullness of the truth. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And you know Nick, what? May I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. You know, one of the one of the things that often gets lobbied against the archbishop is, uh, since we're talking about the documents, this came to mind. Um, you know, there's people who will say, "Well, Archbishop Lefebvre signed the documents." Mm -hmm. You know, the things that you know, like most of the documents that are problematic, you know, kind of signed off on them. What, what do you think about that? Do you think that's a legitimate uh, rebuttal, or or is there something more to that? Mm -hmm. I think there. I think it's a, there's something absolutely more to that because. It is one of those kind of like Uno reverse ultimate Trump mm -hmm. cards. It's like, well, the Feb signed right. the document, so that must have mean. But it's kind therefore of therefore like, they're good. Therefore they're good. Yeah, and so it's kind of like this. You have to go back and you have to read what was the discussions going on. So, for instance, let me just take one example: religious liberty, which we're about to jump into, is that essentially the, the basic gist of the teaching is that man has human dignity. And inside of his human dignity is the right to not only not have uh, be coerced into another religion, but also to be civilly allowed to publicly express his religion. It was on that second mm -hmm. point the archbishop said was an error, because the first point is definitely in line with Catholic teaching. Um, and so what happened is you see this put out there, but the document almost doesn't pass. 
A lot of people don't know this, but you guys might find this interesting. When the document came forward, it was shut down four to five times. The document was pushed back four to five times by the Chetos to where eventually they were just going to drop the entire idea of religious liberty. They said, you know what? We're not getting a good majority of votes, or at least not as much as we Paul VI would like. Let's just drop it and move on to another subject. So they drop it. The next day, the media is firestorming Paul VI because, uh, you know, essentially um, the Pope had brought the entire media apparatus into the council, which he should never have done. And mm -hmm. Paul VI says, no, vote on it now. And so he comes down hard. And he says, no, vote on it. And a ton of bishops, I'm not saying Lefebvre was in this camp, but got scared and voted and the document passed. Um, and so when you go back and you realize these historical things, you realize Okay, there's a lot of more complexities even beside the philosophical and theological currents in the documents. It is also true that the documents, you kind of have to see how they flesh out in the sense of how they work practically. And so when the archbishop saw the Vatican's tell both Italy and Spain as examples, drop Catholicism as the official religion because of Dignitatis Humanae, you know, he saw all of this as a complete disaster. And so it's again, a, it's a kind of an act of prudence on his part uh, that you find this. And it's a good thing you bring this up even with religious liberty because let me show you guys this now, as we transition into this final section on the consecrations, Archbishop Lefebvre, right? He, you can't understand religious liberty, much less the consecrations without a CC, right? So he sees a CC and so what does he do? He petitions in 1987, I believe it's the year, 86 or 87, but I think it's 87, Rome to do two things. One, he sends them the request to ordain bishops because he's getting older. He, I don't know if he knew this at the time, but uh, we know this now. His body was racked with cancer, and so he was mm -hmm. going to die. And so he knew that the society would not continue uh, to exist, uh, at least be able to ordain priests if he was not going to have a successor, if you will. And so just like the big schismatic that he was, what did he do? He, he approached Rome and asked for, <laughs> and asked for bishops, which, <laughs> um, which, is, which is really funny because if you go and read the discussions on the Arian crisis, St. Eusebius and St. Athanasius, when the Pope essentially was just accepting Arianism, you know what they did? They just went city by city ordaining bishops they went like all over the Mediterranean, just ordained bishops <laughs> all over the place. And so Lefebvre, wow, what Lefebvre, chads. Yeah, Lefebvre, you could honestly say, was maybe a bit ultramontane growing up in the, the era of Pius X um, and his mm -hmm, success, mm -hmm. right? So he got used to this. So he approaches, asks for this, and they start getting into talks. Well, as well, he also submits a dubia, a question, right, uh, on the subject of religious liberty, essentially saying, Holy Father, how can we... How can we justify this? And they actually don't respond for a year. At least they respond, you know, because we kind of grew up in the era of the popes not responding to you. <laughs> right. Um, right. But they at least respond. And what I want to show you guys is now this, just, just one sentence from a paragraph that really causes the archbishop to decide to go ahead and consecrate the bishops. And so this right here, uh, it's, it's highlighted right here. I'm going to read this, this whole paragraph, paragraph four. And this is on again, he, he's submitting this under the discussion of religious liberty. And so the Vatican responds and they say, amongst other things, they say, moreover, with the study of these questions, so like religious liberty, it will be necessary also to keep in mind that, as we know, the tradition of the church, which the magisterium is the organ and the authentic interpreter of faith, is a living reality. This tradition cannot be simply repetition, but includes a doctrinal development with continuity as the history of the church uh, amply proves. Now here's the kicker, if you will. The fact that on the question of religious liberty, the Second Vatican Council represents undoubtedly, this means essentially undoubtedly, a certain newness relative to the prior magisterium cannot be a problem if, it's, if it is a newness which is formed within its reality of the quote, development within continuity. Now here's the big problem. They're admitting that the teachings in the Second Vatican Council represent a, quote, newness to the prior magisterium. Well, any Catholic who knows his theology is going to know that the magisterium is two things. You have extraordinary magisterium and universal ordinary magisterium. Extraordinary magisterium is the Pope coming out proclaiming dogma infallibly, like with the Assumption, or a council coming out with dogma, say, anathema sit, right, 
a la Trent, a la every other council. Mm -hmm. But then with the ordinary universal magisterium, it's essentially what have all the popes taught up to this point? Well, the ordinary magisterium on religious liberty is clear. They're absolutely against it. So when they say that it is undoubtedly a newness when it comes to the prior magisterium, but it's just a development, this fundamentally shows a lack of Thomistic understanding of genus. Because guess what? A, doc a dogma does not change in its genus from one thing to another. But as Pius IX says, we polish a doctrine so that we understand it better. The genus is still always the truth. So they fully admit that this is a new newness in doctrine. So what happens is Archbishop Lefebvre says, okay, uh, this is Mayday, right? They're literally flat out saying that this is newness in prior to the light of magisterium and there cannot be such thing. That's basic <laughs> level one theology. And so he is having these talks with uh, Cardinal Ratzinger and with John Paul II, and they agree in principle to allowing him to have one bishop. And they basically agree uh, essentially on, okay, uh, you will be brought into full canonical recognition, you'll have your one bishop, and you're in a certain sense free to question these areas of the Second Vatican Council as long as we try to dialogue and try to get this Essentially, it was the attitude of, we don't know how this fits with the prior magisterium, these teachings of Vatican II, but why don't you show us how it works? It was kind of that mentality. And so what ends up happening, though, is the famous story where um, Lefebvre withdraws his signature, right? He withdraws his signature, and he decides, no, I'm not going to sign to this agreement. Um, even though I've signed it, I'm going to withdraw my signature. And the story goes is that he says, you know, he was a man of prayer. He was a deep man of the contemplative life. And he says that he apparently had, uh, I believe it was Our Lady, appear to him and essentially say, you know, you can sign this and you'll be brought into full recognition and the priesthood will be just absolutely in peril. Or you can withdraw this and essentially the restoration of the priesthood, the, the, um, the, the sacraments of all time will be preserved. And so he decides to do the latter. He withdraws his signature. And what ensues is the famous 1988 consecrations. Um, real quick, before we dive into this, uh, if you could maybe give me a couple sentence response. But the first time that you ever came in contact with, you heard that Lefebvre was excommunicated, quote unquote, for um, ordaining bishops. What was your guys' original thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to, I'll, I'll, I'll. <laughs> Let me just tell you a quick story. Maybe this will help. I'm going to throw Rudy under the bus. <laughs> oh, I have boy. been going to the Fraternity of St. Peter for a few months uh, back in Los Angeles. And I had essentially disappeared from my Novus Ordo friend group. Um, and no, none, of them, <laughs> none of them would come to me to Mass. Um, and I'd come back sometimes and I was, I was becoming that, that weird guy that went trad, right? And I remember uh, I caught up with Rudy at this thing called Beacon at St. John's Seminary, this young adult thingy. And I said, hey, you know, like, it's good to see you, whatever, whatever. I've been attending a mass with the FSSP. <laughs> and Rudy, Rudy at the top, he pauses and he looks at me. He goes, the FSSP? Aren't they in schism? <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 not the SSP. Actually, the fraternity of St. Peter. Like, <laughs> so, and of course, you know, this was so, um, <laughs> I remember growing up. And it's very funny because it's it's hard sometimes to recall everything without like placing Jordan as he is back in when he was. I do remember growing up and I felt like I grew up knowing that the society of Pope Pius X was schismatics and they were schismatics because because they denied um, they denied the Pope. Now, I know that that's not only absurd, that's just patently not true. And I remember once <laughs> I'm a seminarian I was, I must have been like 18, 19, 20. And I met a seminarian at the airport. I thought he was a priest. And I went up to him and said, oh, you're a priest. He's wearing a, he was a long cassock. And I hadn't really seen a lot of those. And I liked them because mm -hmm. historical me, you know, I just liked them. And I said, hey, you know, like, it's good to see you. Like, you know, are you a priest? And he goes, no, I'm a seminarian. And I said, oh, where are you a seminarian? And I don't know which seminary he told me, but obviously it was, a, he said, you know, it's, it's an SSPX seminary here, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a guy like my age, right, 20 years old. And so I was like, okay, cool. Like, cool. And I remember my heart beating. And I was like, oh, so Nick right? Luster I Pearls. <laughs> I know, right? Well, I remember, like, as I walked away, I was like, I was like, should I go, like, chase after him and just say, like, you know, it'd be nice. Like, I, I, I wait genuinely, like, I listen, like, I wait for the day, like, that, like, 
you guys are reunited with Rome. Um, oh, no. Not like the canonical. I, I thought about doing that. I really thought about it. I didn't end up doing it. But I remember really having that thought. Like, I was like sad. I was like, you know, like, I think that like this guy likes, loves Christ. And it was just, it's just a shame that he's just outside of the church. Um, <laughs> needless to say, as your viewers know, as, as our listeners know, I've had an extremely long and I think very logical sort of conversion or maybe understanding probably better on Archbishop Lefebvre. If you go back to our first podcast, you can hear me say, you know, Rudy and I are recommending like going to the Dotson and fraternity Latin masses. And I say, I'm not going to comment on the society of Pope Pius X. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to comment for comment against because I was still trying just to kind of figure it out. Um, but it stopped becoming a bad word years ago. And um, and I'm very grateful for that because it's very clear that the Archbishop was an extraordinarily saintly man. And mm -hmm. to echo Rudy, which I'm sure you know, his point's perfect. He's very deeply in the cult use of Archbishop Lefebvre. Uh, I do foresee, if he's not already, which he probably is, God willing, um, I think he definitely should be a saint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, praise God. I, I, <laughs> I'm so thankful that uh, you know you can have a conversion of heart because. In the beginning, it was very, you know, it's, it's just hearsay, really. I think when, when you talk to your day-to-day -day Catholic, you mentioned the society, all they have to go on is hearsay. And they say, oh, well, he's a schismatic, or he was excommunicated. And those things are, they're not true. And um, and so he gets, he gets kind of like a, a bad rap. But I think what's really important to understand it, it not, and this is advice not just for Archbishop Lefebvre, but it could be pertaining to anything that is considered to be controversial. Um, the thing that you have to keep in mind is there there's always people with a chip on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. People interpret things the way that they want to interpret most of the time. And the danger of that is that it becomes groupthink. Mm -hmm. And so in order to combat this, especially with something like this that pertains to the history of the church and, and the well-being of Holy Mother of the Church, I recommend that you would read his documents, read any of his writings, and you'll understand, you'll, you'll, you'll come away with an understanding of his great love and zeal for, for souls, and, and you'll have a better perspective as to why he decided to, to proceed with, with the ordinations in Econ in 1988. Those those ordinations, I think, were required. It was it was a requirement for for the church to wake up a little bit and understand that that he was standing up for eternal Rome. He was standing up for something that was being stolen from from Catholics. This is our patrimony, and it was taken away from us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, Nick, I just want to I just really want to say, just I think this is a, a good point to say, but. You know, we are seeing with the society, with the fraternities you talked about before, what we've talked about before is we're seeing this great divorce. And mm -hmm. Catholics who, and you know, post the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, this great wound in the church. One thing that I've been really meditating on, especially as, I, as a traditional Catholic is, I don't fault people like my grandparents, people like my parents for not having, for, for not engaging in a war that wasn't their fight speaking with. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very grateful to my, you know, I, yes, I grew up in a pretty like hippy dippy Novus Ordo and all that kind of stuff, but I'm grateful to my parents because they really believed and to an extent, of course, true, but the, the faith that was passed down to them, they wanted to give to their children. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have any of these thoughts in my head if it wasn't for those encounters of Christ, even in the craziness of the Novus Ordo. I mean, when I, when I took my vows of confirmation, I meant them. I, I really felt the Holy Spirit on me and I didn't know that that would mean to be led to where where we all three of us are right now. Um, and so I've been really meditating because I think, you know, one of the reasons like we have a large podcast when we have yours is I didn't want to just, I don't hate Novus Ordite, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't hate yeah. people who, like, I have conversations with a lot of people who just are not going to cross the Tiber line and they just don't get it. Yeah. Um, and and I don't, and I think about my grandparents are because they're, they're way holier people, people than I could ever espouse to be. Um, and I know that like, you know, in this great divorce, we, I'm learning more and more of trusting in God's mercy. We have our sense of the will, we have intellect, we have these discussions and, and they're true, right? We're bringing back the truths of the faith, but I'm really realizing that, you know, in this great fallout, a lot of Catholics were just clinging on to what they knew. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and I'm I'm sure that even in the midst of all this sacrilege and the, the heresy and the false excommunications and everything, I, I realize that this is why I'm so adamant that God's really in control here and that God's mercy and his justice are one. Um, and that it has to be because we're in such a mess that only our only our Lord can, can sort it out. Yeah, no, I fully agree. I fully agree. So what what I want to show you guys now here is, so this is the code of canon law from the ancient Vatican website. Um, I think probably uh, the Vatican <laughs> website seems to be as old as SSPX now, um, which, which is so funny because, I mean, real quick, I just have to get this off my chest. When you look at the society's website, like compared to just the Vatican's website, I mean, come on, you know what I'm saying? Like the society just has it together. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> okay, yeah, but you know, but you know what's good about that at least. So when the consecration, like, so I saw the Life Site News article before. Maybe Rudy had actually told me about the consecration happening. I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna believe this. And it wasn't yeah. the fact that I pulled it up on my phone and I saw it yellow in the back that the Vatican was. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, thank God, it's legitimate. <laughs> that is a fair. That is a fair point. I do stand corrected. That's funny. <laughs> So what, what you have here is this is section, uh, this is canons 1378 through 1389 of the Code of Canon Law. So this is the modern Code of Canon Law, the 1983 code. And um, what you have here is Lefebvre, this was in his mind, right? So he's he knows he needs to consecrate bishops. He knows that without consecrating bishops, there's no bishops in the world who are going to ordain traditional priests. So therefore, there's mm -hmm. not going to be any traditional masses or traditional sacraments. It's going to be a spiral. And so the bishops are kind of the key here. But he's aware of this right here, this canon, right? Canon in 1382, right here, which uh, reads as follows. A bishop who consecrates someone, a bishop, without a pontifical mandate, and the person who receives the consecration from him incur a latent sententia, which means an automatic excommunication reserved to the apostolic see. So Archbishop Flev, he knows this. One thing he does take into account is, number one, he obviously has asked Rome, but number two, in the 1917 Code of Canon Law, this was not an excommunicational, excommunicatable, I think, is that how you'd say it, mm -hmm. offense. And um, you would have just been suspended in faculties. You would not have been excommunicated. Now, the reason that excommunication was added was that there was the Chinese bishops right in the 1950s under Pius XII who were ordaining bishops illicitly for their communist nonsense going on, right? And so Pius mm -hmm. XII was just kind of like, nope, stop. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there was. Oh, a it's a good thing we'd never approve anything like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Nowadays we have Rome who ordains communist bishops, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that's but what happens is he, you know, so he recognizes all this, but what he recognizes is from 1917 to 1983, the act of ordaining a bishop without a papal mandate is not intrinsically, meaning in and of itself, a sin, right? Now, it could become sinful, but it doesn't necessarily intrinsically say, unlike adultery, right? Adultery is always 100% of the time objectively sinful. It's never okay for any reason. Whereas ordaining a bishop without a papal mandate kind of depends. So what he takes into account, which is what we're going to look at now, is these following guidelines, essentially. So real quick, to summarize, um, he goes ahead with it, right? And on June uh, 30th, I believe is the date, he ordains not one but four bishops, and he's very clear in his speech that we are not setting up a parallel church. I am not a parallel pope. This is not a parallel hierarchy. These bishops don't even have diocese. Um, they are not in charge. They're essentially just here to perform sacraments on the behalf of the society. That's all that they're here for, which again goes to show like this guy was not interested in going off and creating his own church. He's just like, literally, mm -hmm. they're just here to confirm and ordain people. That's literally the only reason that they exist for the most part. Um, and so he recognizes that like you need truly Catholic bishops. Now, one tidbit of historical fact that you might be interested in is that at the time, the attendance at the Society of St. Pius X worldwide was only about 60,000 people. So he, it's traditionalism is pretty small, right? 60,000 out of I don't know what the population was. I know it wasn't a billion Catholics at the time, but it's still pretty dang small. So he ordains them, 
And what happens is right before the ordination, you have the famous story of the limousine that pulls up right in front of the <laughs> seminaries. And they're Such like an odd story. It is. They're like hopping the car. <laughs> They're hopping the car. John Paul II wants to speak to you. It's kind of like his last ditch effort to get him away so he couldn't ordain bishops. You know, Bishop DeCastro mm-hmm. would have just done it anyway. That's what's funny about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, he would have been like, oh, you just made me even more mad. All right. Oh, I'm doing um, it on the phone now. <laughs> yeah. Like he would have been like, you three priests get up here. We're making, we're making more. <laughs> um, <laughs> like he would have been so done then. But so he <laughs> And he says, no, I'm not going. You've had ample time, right? Because during this whole discussions with Rome, Rome kept pushing the dates back and making all of these ridiculous parameters that he could fill out. They're Mm -hmm. they're trying to get me to die, essentially, from cancer. So he ordains the bishops. He doesn't take the limousine route. And he gets immediately, right, latent sententia. But again, I'm putting it in air quotes, excommunicated. John Paul II comes out with, I believe, two days later with his motu proprio Ecclesia de Afflicta, which, right, is basically him saying this is a great wound. This was a schismatic act. Archbishop Lefebvre has excommunicated himself along with the four bishops. And I feel sorry for all of the people that are involved in the Lefebvrean movement. But you need to (laughs) jump ship and come back to the Ark of Peter, if you will. The Archbishop Lefebvre said these excommunications were null and void. They don't exist. And here's why they don't exist. And so this is what I want to show you guys. Here in the Code of Canon Law, this is under Canon 1323. So this is in the same section as uh, the excommunication. Here are the the prescriptions, right? According to if this is like legit excommunication. Mm -hmm. So first, a person has to be at least 16. Right. So this is essentially you have to have reason, right? You're not just an idiot 13 year old going and doing something. Um, so yes, Archbishop Lefebvre, right? He's in his seventies or eighties at this time. So he's pretty old. Um, we also have to recognize that you have to take ignorance into account, right? So a person without, who without negligence was ignorant, right? Violated the law would not fall into this. A person who acted uh, due to physical force, right? So that doesn't count because obviously Archbishop Lefebvre wasn't being physically forced to ordain somebody. But then this is where it gets really interesting. Number four, it says a person who acted coerced by grave fear or even if only relatively grave or due to a necessity or grave inconvenience unless the act is intrinsically evil or tends to the harm of souls. Meaning that like if a person due to some grave necessity has to ordain or do one of those things because it's not intrinsically evil. He can. And what we find is that you even have uh, further on down right here in number five, referring to, again, this idea of coerce, it says, by a person who was coerced by grave fear, even if only relatively grave or due to necessity or grave inconvenience, if the delicate is intrinsically evil or tends to the harm of souls, right? But as it goes on further down, it even talks about how even if you think, right, mm-hmm. that you think that this is intrinsically evil, or not, excuse me, not intrinsically evil, but necessary, right, then you go ahead and, and do this. And so Archbishop Lefebvre is saying, okay, this is absolutely necessary. The state of souls is going on. That's why, again, we looked at Assisi first, because it's like in the world of Assisi, if all you see is essentially, yeah, Buddhist statues are being put on top of tabernacles, they're saying that other religions have the civil right not to be uh, perturbed by the U.S. government or by the governments of any society. Mm-hmm. Social kingship of Christ is therefore null and void and out the window. Um, then the only in, in the new mass, right, being illicit and dangerous to souls because of its neo Protestant neo modernist bent. I have to ordain bishops, so he ordains bishops. He gets quote unquote excommunicated. And what ends up happening is in Ecclesia de Afflicta, this is the last document I want you guys to look at, John Paul II, again, makes one stark omission that most people don't know, which is the following. He talks about, um, again, like returning to the Febrian movement, and he basically talks about the problem with Archbishop Lefebvre is that he didn't have a proper understanding of tradition. He doesn't understand that tradition is living, whatever that means, um, (laughs) and therefore it doesn't work. If you guys want to understand more about living tradition, I'm going to link in the description below an article written by Bishop Desilla Mallory talking about why living tradition is essentially 
a modernist understanding of tradition. But in this, yeah, we've seen how living documents in the Constitution work. Never mind this. Yeah, exactly. That's a great <laughs> point. That's a great point. Because uh, right now the anti-federalists seem kind of justifiable in what they what they said. So here's what you find. Look at this. He says in this document, he says, moreover, I should like to remind theologians and other experts in ecclesiastical sciences, so in theology, that they should feel themselves called upon to answer in the present circumstances. Indeed, the extent and depth of the teaching of the Second Vatican Council call for a remedy commitment to a deeper study in order to reveal clearly the council's continuity with tradition. Real quick, funny thing that I find funny is that if it's a clear continuity, then why do you need to do a deeper study? But this is what, <laughs> side note, this is what's the interesting line. He says this, especially in points of doctrine, which perhaps because they are new, key phrase right there, have not yet well been understood by some sections of the church. Now, why this doesn't work is this document, Pastor Eternus from Vatican I. This is an actual dogmatic council, by the way, um, unlike the former. <laughs> <Got him. laughs> and what you find in here is this. So under the uh, prescriptions for papal infallibility, you find all these subsections. Now, again, for the the Catholic out there who maybe struggles with a kind of ultramontane, everything the Pope says is infallible. I recommend you go read this. I'll link it again in the description, but specifically number six right here. This is one of the things that the Pope is not allowed to do. He says this, for the Holy Spirit was promised to the successors of Peter, not so that they might, by his revelation, referring to the Pope, make known some new doctrine, but that by his assistance, they might religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelation or deposit transmitted by the apostles. So again, Vatican I is saying you can't, the Pope has no authority to create new doctrines. The only job that the Pope can do is clarify, polish, if you will, the doctrines handed over by the apostle. That's why Archbishop Lefebvre, one of his great sayings is, I merely handed on what I received, right? He just received what the apostle said and went with it. Whereas John Paul II, in this document is very clearly saying, right, just what the dubious said, that these are new doctrines, which the Pope, according so, to Vatican one, can't do. Oh my gosh. So Nick, so for years and years and years, even, even, especially popular amongst trads is to say, listen, the Vatican, Second Vatican Council taught no new dogmas or doctrine. There's no new anathemas, right? There are no new ex cathedras. Mm -hmm. And so, and then they say, like, even Paul the Sixth did this. So like sneaking of like the Vatican Jews, the ordinary magisterium doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Does this mean, uh, however, we see from the dubia, we see from John Paul letter here. So is this not something that would have been known in the 80s and even prior? Did the, did, was there really this push where actually there is this new doctrine that has been created? Just mm -hmm. really so? Or would you even have gotten like people been like, oh, no, no, there's no new doctrine or dogma. This is a pastoral council. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So essentially two things. One, what happened was is they recognize fundamentally that both John the 23rd from the very beginning of the council, as well as Paul the VI continuously echoing him until after the council was done, was very clear, like you said, that this is a pastoral council, meaning that we are not going to have any ex cathedra statements from either the council or the pope come out. So therefore, people assume, okay, this kind of is going to fall back, therefore, on the ordinary universal magisterium. But the problem that you find is that with the documents, it's a mix. That's the problem. It's a mix. That's why, for instance, you can read De Verbum, right, on the sacred scripture. You can find some ambiguous stuff in there that you can really interpret wrong, but then you can also interpret it right, right? So you can find a certain continuity there. Mm -hmm. Then you find, for instance, in some of these declarations, like the Declaration on Ecumenism or Religious Liberty, these lower level teachings, this, as they're saying, newness in teaching, which, again, while the documents don't say newness, the guys like you've talked about who wrote it and instilled it clearly said it was a new uh, it was a new doctrine. Let me present real quick to you just to, to back up what I'm saying. I have this document right here that uh, if you want, I can email both of you guys. This is a document I compiled it's all the quotes on religious liberty that I know of. And one of the things I want to highlight to you is what some of the theologians real quick said about this. So real quick, a couple of these you guys might have heard of. But for instance, Benedict XVI on this discussion of religious liberty says this quote, and this, as you can see, comes from Principles of Catholic Theology, page uh, 381. He says this, if it is desirable to offer a diagnosis 
of the text of Vatican II's document Gaudium et Spes as a whole, we might say that in the conjunction with the text on religious liberty, so what we're talking about, and world religions, it is a revision of the syllabus of Pius IX, a kind of counter syllabus, a, a result, the one sidedness of the position adopted by the church under Pius IX and Pius X in response to the situation created by a new phase of history inaugurated by the French Revolution was to a large extent corrected. So that famous syllabus of errors that you guys know, he's saying that Dignitas Sumane and Gaudium et Spes are a certain counter syllabus. He also says right here, page 385, by a kind of inner necessity, therefore, the optimism of the counter syllabus gave way to a new cry that was far more intense and far more dramatic than the former one. He also says right here, 381, the task is not, therefore, to suppress the council, but to discover the real council and to deepen and to deepen its true intention in the light of the present experience. I'm talking. I'll be right back. Yeah. He says that me that means that there can be no return to the counter syllabus, which may have marked the first stage in the confrontation with liberalism and a newly conceived Marxism, but cannot be the last stage. Real quick, one thing I want to highlight here is that if you have a hermeneutic of continuity, then why can't you return back to the syllabus? You have also right here, Yves Congar, right? Another father, Vatican II, a huge Nouvelle Theologie thinker who says this, quote, it cannot be denied that the text, right, referring to the religious liberty, like this mm -hmm. does, does materially say something different from the syllabus of 1864, and even almost the opposite in Propositions 1577 to 79 of the document. So this is saying that, yeah, in materially, this is a contradiction again by one of the Vatican II fathers. And then the last one I'd like to show you, these last two quotes is Father John Courtney Murray, right? Famous, uh, I guess, like liberal Catholic American thinker says, <coughs> The course of the development between the syllabus of errors and Dignitas Sumane remains, uh, still remains to be explained by theologians. Hongs Kung, who you guys, I bet, both know, he says this about Marcel Lefebvre and religious liberty, quote, I think that he is wrong, but nevertheless, what he argues, what he is arguing is theoretically unresolved questions. Lefebvre had the every right to question the council's declaration on religious liberty, Kung says, right? And this is what Kung says. He says, quote, the council evaporated the problems, right? Kung, exit, Kung insists because it calls into question the doctrine of infallibility. And so Kung responds and says, quote, the council's bishops said, it's too complicated to express how you can go from condemnation of religious liberty to the affirmation of a purely oh negation of progress. So again, now, to be fair, what's funny here, though, is you have Kung and Congar, who are kind of the more liberal Nouvelle Theology guys. But you also have Benedict XVI, who's the quote unquote conservative one. Mm -hmm. They're all saying the same thing. And again, with Benedict says that there can, that we have to understand the true intentions of the council and through understanding the true intentions, we can't return to the syllabus of error. Then how do you have a continuity between the two if you can't return? So when you look at John Paul II, as well as the dubia, and they're saying this is the newness you have the liberals of Kung, Schielebeck's Congar, Murray. You have the conservatives of John Paul II and Ratzinger all saying the same thing Lefebvre is saying, that it is a new doctrine. The difference is they're going to have different opinions on how, if that's good or not. So that's why, in my opinion, I'm like, the archbishop is exonerated not by his stance in the stuff that he did, which I would still agree with, but by their own words alone. That's my opinion. You know, I I don't, yeah, I don't want to toot your own horn too much, um, because. But I've never heard anyone break down such a thing in such a eloquent and simple manner for like everyone to understand. And I'm gonna be really worried if we. I hope that we're in the same papal or government prison together. I hope we're <laughs> in the same gulag, all three of us. Can I just say I, I I went away just because I was I was looking for my. I have just the the the. Council of Trent. I have the book on all the Council of Trent. Mm -hmm. Trent, like Vatican one, these councils are so easy. I, you, when we think about what came after Trent, the freaking Counter Reformation. It wasn't people like point of the documents. Wait a second. So, what does the Catholic Church believe about the Eucharist now? <laughs> it was like this is what the Church believes. We've gone over every single sacrament. We've gone over every single thing. We affirm. We're not running away. We're going forward. And then as a result, 
Catholic culture was like, oh my gosh, we're in a real springtime. Let's mm -hmm. make some art. Let's let's <laughs> beat them. Let's send our missionaries to the far off corners of the world. Mm -hmm. Vatican II, we are, God, God Ziggs, we are like 70 years on from this blessed thing. <laughs> And and I've never I've never seen so succinctly just put in like the fact that these people it's not a matter of that's not a matter of ambiguity anywhere it is obviously but it, it's a matter of they're actually coming and saying that there's newness there's actually new doctrine so in other words people who argue against Lefebvre's case he freaked out he wanted to start his own church he didn't understand that he didn't understand that there were no new doctrines or dogmas who the heck is lying here yeah they we have their word that's crazy honestly is that's amazing mm -hmm. wow yeah no it's so true you know <laughs> <laughs> i think about uh you know like for example this is a, another allegory but media always tells you that there's there's fake news out there and there's like all this stuff that's it, it's, you shouldn't believe it etc but who is the main propagator of fake news, if not the media, right? So uh, just, it reminds me of that. Um, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I got my, my whole, my whole breath got taken away with that. <laughs> Religious liberty is something that I, I, I ponder a lot these days. You know, we, we think about our government too here in, in America, you know, religious liberty is something that is important to people, but we never stop and think about whether or not that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Religious liberty allows false religions to be able to be, uh, there's a false equivalency there. And um, I think it's our duty if we're to reclaim Christendom or at least to reestablish Christendom, we have to be able to establish wholeheartedly that Christianity is the only religion, it's the only true thing, and there shouldn't be anything else besides it. Yeah, absolutely agree. I, I appreciate all of those sentiments. One one book I'd like to recommend for people who want to know more about religious liberty, I've actually, I'm going through it for the first time myself, is the book, um, They Have Uncrowned Him, again, by Archbishop Lefebvre. This came out in 1987, so one year before so the Akon consecrations. Yes, it's wonderful. Um, you can find this, I'll definitely put the link to uh, Angela's Press, but you can also, the mm -hmm. Society has been putting out uh, podcasts of the chapters recorded, very dramatized, very good. Um, it, it breaks down how all of these principles, according to these men, um, are fundamentally the liberal principles inaugurated in 1789. And I guess the one area where I can definitely work on with in more charity is recognizing like sometimes you see right with these quotes, right, that they're openly saying this stuff. But at the same time, they're gaslighting anyone who's calling a foul. And they're mm -hmm. saying, how dare you? You're, you're acting like it's schismatic. And you don't even have just the hierarchy do this. You have um, you know, your average priests do this, as well as many people that you even, that are more equipped. We're 70 years on from this, and we're still trying to find theories of how you can square the documents. We just need to fundamentally, I think, just humble ourselves as a church and recognize what St. Robert Bellarmine and many of the other saints have said, which is that the only infallible things in councils are the dogmas proclaimed and that these are not dogmas, right? Mm -hmm. That this clearly doesn't square with the ordinary magisterium either because they're, I mean, every side seems to be saying, yeah, it's new. And so let's just humble ourselves, reopen this thing and get rid of this nonsense because it's yeah. not helping anyone. We saw how it's also practically played out. It's completely destroyed the conceptions of like Catholic nation states and if we want mm. any of this to change, we have to humble ourselves and recognize, okay, we're not challenging the indefectibility of the church. The indefectibility of the church is a dogma and exists, but it's in dogmas. It's not in these minor declarations, which can be up for debate. That's why even Cardinal Brandmuller, right? Cardinal, the famous conservative Cardinal who doesn't like the SSPX has clearly said that on Dignitatis Humanae and Nostra Aetate, they are open opinions that the SSPX is allowed to debate. These are not points of like, this is the Trinity or the son of God, right? Mm -hmm. These are points that we can debate. And that's what the SSPX wants. It wants to be brought into the full canonical structure of the church and be able to protest these things and say, yeah, you can resist this and still be quote unquote, fully a Catholic in the Vatican's eyes. I believe obviously that to be fully Catholic, you have to, in a certain sense, once you know, of course, 
reject this idea that all religions are kind of just more or less the same Mm -hmm. or that you know that religious liberty is just a good thing these are poisonous doctrines um i want to give you guys the final word but before i do so real quick uh maybe you can give your final word in this question speaking of crazy things and restoring the social kingship of christ this week right Pope Francis has come out and has um, acquiesced to the requests of the Ukrainian bishops in consecrating Russia and Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, When I initially saw this, I was number one excited. And like I said on my social media, I was like, well, I am a Fatima purist. Everything has to be there. If this isn't legit, then we'll still receive grace. So I'm not going to be upset about that. But I want it obviously to be legit. Let's please pray that this happens. And the biggest thing is allow the bishops to come in, command the bishops to consecrate along with you. Mm -hmm. Well, it was brought out by, I think even early this morning, last night by Catholic Family News, and it was legit that Pope Francis has asked the Apostolic Nuncio to ask all the bishops of the U.S. I've also heard this for the U.K. uh, and other countries as well, that it seems like he's inviting all the bishops, right, to consecrate Russia specifically to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I don't know what's going to happen. I am excited. Uh, Again, it's like I mentioned to Jordan before the show started. Um, When the Pope does something good, I give him a thumbs up. And when the Pope does something bad, I give him a thumbs down with all filial piety as a son, right? And unfortunately, it just tends to be these days where you're having to put more thumbs down than thumbs up. But this, in my opinion, is a good thing. Whether or not it ends up being 100% legit, time will tell. Um, however, I do think it's very important that we all do pray that what Our Lady requested does happen. It does seem, at the moment anyway, before it all happens, that everything's lining up according to book, so that's good. But I wanted to get, what's your guys' overall opinion on on everything we've covered and how this integrates, this conception of Our Lady of Fatima, how this integrates into the story? Jordan, you go ahead. Well, you can see a wonderful episode of Catholic Drive Time in which Rudy and Jordan discuss <laughs> it. <laughs> um, oh, that was man. Fun. That was a vast. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that as a church, we need to humble ourselves. And um, a church is not just a weird monolithic word. We are all members of the body of Christ. Therefore, it's up to us as the members to humble ourselves. That's how the church humbles itself. Mm-hmm. So it's amazing to me that I think as we live in these crazy times, it's it's terribly exciting realizing that there are divine forces at work every single day that I never see and nor do I feel the weight of fully. And that's by grace of God. If we if we felt just as much as we, if we felt the weight of our of the the enormity of God's love, we wouldn't be able to comprehend it. We would explode. And if we felt the weight of our sins inversely, like we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to re- we would be just a sobbing mess all the time. Um, I am. I pray that this is what Our Lady really meant, and I pray that Pope Francis really does this. And it seems like by all the steps that are happening, this is extraordinarily positive. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my joke was that I might almost forgive him for the paganism of Pachamama, but, <laughs> but genuinely, I I'm in such awe that you know, in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of these utter terrible gutter fights that never should have happened, that that Christ loves us so much, Our Lady loves us so much that she hasn't given up on us and Christ our Lord, God himself has not given up on us. And that if we realize the enormity of, of what we do to offend, I any of us, if we were God in the universe, would have walked away a long time ago. I mean, we would have just had another flood and just called it a day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this, this war with Russia, Ukraine, Russia spreading her errors, whatever you want to say, I mean, all these things are, are, are playing their parts. And it's amazing to me that how is it that a hundred years ago to three shepherd children, while Russia was still czar or czarist monarchy, by the way, our lady essentially reveals how near and dear Russia is to her heart and how near to Russia is to the heart of the entirety of the church. And a hundred years on from that, Russia has done spread her errors. She's not communist anymore, but there we're, especially here in the West are feeling the effects of it, how this may be, one of the greatest things that have happened in the history of the church that that russia has a part to play in salvation history that none of us fully understand yet and so i hope that people are preparing because remember it's not just consecrations it's consecration for all the bishops it's the first saturday's devotions i hope we're all gearing up towards that mm-hmm. um 
you know, pray to St. Vladimir, pray to St. Olga, pray to St. Andrew. These are the patrons of Russia and of Ukraine, the, the, Kiev, the Kievan Rus people. And really join ourselves, especially on that day, that, that the consecration may be good and pleasing, as it should have always been. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I'm just in, I'm just in such excitement because I, I really feel like God's working in ways I don't understand. And I need to work on humbly and submitting myself to these sort of divine, divine plans in motion. Mm -hmm. That's so true, Jordan. Yeah, we, we deserve so much worse. And I'm, I'm happy that the Pope is, is doing this and inviting all of the, the bishops to participate with him in consecrating Russia and Ukraine. Um, Thanks to Matt Gaspers uh, for, yeah. for getting that information. Yeah. God bless you. Um, that being said, uh, you know, we, we did have a conversation with, uh, with uh, Julio Loretto from the, the TFP, Tradition, Family, and Property, mm -hmm. this morning on the radio program. And, you know, he mentioned, he made a really interesting distinction that it seems as if the Pope's intention in this consecration is for peace a resolution to the war which isn't exactly what the the right intention should be it should be about consecrating russia and you know uh, uh reparation for the uh mm -hmm. for the offenses against the immaculate heart of mary and that sort of thing so that's an interesting distinction but you know we can get into the weeds when we really look into all of this all of this craziness and all of the scenarios that could possibly happen, whether or not uh, the Holy Father will do it to the the express instructions that our, our Lady gave us, you know, we could drive ourselves crazy thinking about this sort of thing. So when we talked on the radio program, Jordan and I, we did an episode about this earlier, earlier in the week, we, we, we just said, you know, there's only so much that we can do. I can't affect whether or not the Pope will do the consecration according to you know, the express instructions or what his intentions are, you know, whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I can really affect is that I can participate in these first Saturday devotions mm -hmm. and make a little bit of reparation to the mm -hmm. blasphemies committed against Our Lady, which is the very reason why she appeared to the Fatima children to begin with. She said that these blasphemies were angering Jesus so much, our blessed Lord so much, that a chastisement was coming because of that. Mm -hmm. Well, what can we do? We we can't affect the, the the hierarchy. We cannot judge the Pope. We are not in a position to do that as lay people. But we can do uh, acts of reparation, which is so required. I mean, just look look at around you all over the world. You see all kinds of blasphemies. You're scrolling through Twitter, you you run into blasphemies without even trying. Mm -hmm. There there's a lot to repair. There's a lot to do, and I just I, I pray that the Holy Father will do it, you know, and, and and do it the right way, so that we can we can just kind of move on. I'm tired of this, you know. We 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 also talked about being part of a post truth society. Now we question everything. We have no confidence in our leaders. We we have no uh, no no fathers that we can we can trust. You know, we question everything, and that's just so exhausting. I wish I wish it was different. So I, I just hope for the best. That's all. That's all that I can do. Otherwise, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go crazy. There's, there's too many variables. There's too many variables. And, and listening to the discourse too of our fellow Catholics talking about, well, it could be this or it could be that. It could be, uh, hey, uh, yeah, it could be. But at the end of the day, does that give you peace? No. <laughs> the only thing you can do is work on yourself. You know, and 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 praise to praise be to God. You know, for for all of the great people that that God has crossed paths with, you know, you including, but I have a friend, Shane Etchison, and he's a really good friend of mine. And he just talks about, look, when it comes to your personal life, your relationship to the world, which is something I'm, I'm trying to struggle with, I'm struggling to figure out how I fit into the world as a Catholic, right? I mean, we talked about integralism, we talked about the government and that sort of thing, and mm -hmm. what, what that's supposed to look like. I struggle with picturing myself in the world like what am i doing here like what kind of change can i affect how much influence do i have etc cetera, etc cetera. and then i realized some words that shane gave me and he said look you just have to be a medieval peasant you just have to work on your own spiritual life yeah. at the end of the day that's the only thing that you can change and so that's that's what i'm going to do and hope for the best mm -hmm. 
That's great and profound wisdom, to be honest, because it's it's so, so, so easy to become disheartened and truly black pill. Mm. I mean, we've all been there at one moment of our, I guess, experiences traditionalists where we've just seen something and we've thought that is it. Like, oh I just cannot be. I mean, it's over. It, yeah, it's <laughs> over. Like, I mean, even for me as a convert, there have been times where, um, you know, the Holy Father will do something and I really just have to take a really hard look in the mirror and be like, did I convert to this? What mm -hmm. on earth? Like, this is even worse than my Protestant stuff that was going on. But then what I remember, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. But what I remember, what I hold on to is it's, I don't convert for a mortal man, Pope Francis. I don't convert for even pretty aesthetics. Mm -hmm. I convert because truth is objective. Truth is something that is real and does exist. And I really appreciate your comment about being in a post-truth society because you're right. It affects us all, whether we like it or not. I really do wish that, you know, we could be right. And like the medieval peasants or even just Catholics in the 1910s where we're just like, Oh, the Pope said something. We haven't heard the Pope say anything in like a bunch of years, even though <laughs> okay. he's still alive. Yeah. He's still alive. <laughs> oh, like two years later. Oh wait, the Pope died two years ago. We have another one. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, like that would be so nice if we could just like every time the Pope set out something, we could like hoard it to ourselves as little treasures, you know, and just like meditate on what he's saying. And you can do this with the older Pope so much. You can like bring it together and it's just a wealth of 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 just knowledge and uh that like employs unity with God. But as you say, being in this age, there is so much scandal. And so we really do need to work on ourselves. And you know, I'm a we all have different solutions. I know that I've been looking um, a bunch of friends and myself who are all pretty diehard SSPX fans. You know, we've often looked around the idea of like, okay, do we all move to St. Mary's, Kansas? Do we all uh, go, to, go that route? We've also thought floated around the idea of, you know, there's a lot of these really gorgeous ancient churches that were built in the United States in these small towns that almost no one lives in the small towns anymore. They're unincorporated. Should we go and just like essentially make a make a new mayflower compact if you will and just go and settle in a town and just redo a town that's another option of course i'm going through school so those those things are way far away but what i can do right now is work on myself so i do encourage you viewers if you guys haven't partaken in the first five saturdays devotion it's part of the message of our lady just as much as pray the rosary every day just as much as the consecration to russia um i also recommend right make that uh nine first fridays of our lord right that devotion to the sacred heart work on yourself pray pray the breviary pray the pray the rosary every day go to holy mass according to the traditional rite as often as you possibly can live that catholic life read your traditional catechisms and kind of just put blinders on you know if you're able to um and don't be bitter and i think that that's really fundamentally you know i'm kind of echoing right now that I think about it, the statement from the archbishop is essentially, you know, read the old catechisms, go to the old mass, and don't be bitter. And I think that that's the, the best advice. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for coming on. Um, what new stuff do you guys have coming up in, in your show? Because, you know, I have obviously stuff that's in the works, but I'm keeping from my audience. Um, but what can, uh, what can some viewers look forward to seeing on your guys' show? Well, we never kiss and tell, as you know, um, we, <laughs> we just keep doing what we're doing. But I will say this uh, in in first on higher regards to you, Nick, thanks for having us on. And you're yeah, such a you're it. such a wonderful brother in Christ and a great compatriot. And and honestly, I, I, I do mean it with all sincerity when I say I hope that we are in the same gulag together, all three of us. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, I will I will speak, therefore, in praise of my other brother, uh, Rudy, uh, currently from from two weeks ago, approximately has this fantastic reflection video called time to die uh which is the latest one on our podcast and you know that it's good when you because when you when you're friends with somebody and, and and friends with someone and you talk to them so often when you listen to them as if you're listening to your favorite commentator uh <laughs> and i know that i know that this is this is high marks and and rudy's an extremely humble guy but honestly i would i would Ask your listeners, please. It's just a, a beautiful thing on, on suffering and Lenten reflections and prayer. Um, and it's, it's very good, just like from the heart kind of explanations. And I find that our channel in and of itself is moving, especially now that 
we, we've moved into marriage, into fatherhood. I think that we've really been reflecting on how to be glad in our, our private lives, but also just like taking up crosses and just enduring them. Um, and I think that that video is a really sobering, wonderful, perfect piece. If you're feeling low in Lent or you're feeling kind of low about situations in your life or, or your, your walk with the Lord, right? We, we have um, mountains, but we also have plateaus and valleys as well. So, um, so I, I'll speak in that praise. We have plenty of always, there's always stuff we're cooking up and, you know, we try to be pretty regular, but uh, I would just say that that video is definitely worth a lot more views if, if you'd be so inclined. Oh, absolutely. I'm definitely going to link <laughs> in the description because I watched it and that was amazing. What I want and what I want you guys to do is I want you to spam their comment sections and ask for the next meme review because that's what I'm looking for is the next <laughs> meme review. Oh. Um, and so we will we will have that. Maybe maybe I could be a guest uh, whenever I come up in person, Jordan, we could do a meme review. Yes, Holy please. Oh my gosh. That how exciting it's going to be. Gosh, we're going to get arrested. <laughs> although although when, when, when us three officially meet, this can't be like a TNT reunion that it just ends up sour so um you know <laughs> well, like see, an awkward video yeah, right. it's like oh we're all real people with legs <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's the best thing too it's like well what we have a great divorce over i mean i think we're i don't know i'm mean, like I, i'm not i'm not i will never be nearly as scholastic or as or as anything as, as you guys so you know it's just gonna be like oh no like did what 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 precise moment does the does the uh, bread and the wine become the body and blood i'm like oh that's it i'm, I'm leaving how dare you <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question though no. nick <laughs> how many angels how many angels did you say dance on the head of a pin oh that's yeah. incorrect yeah. that's that's incorrect. not correct uh-huh <laughs> it's clearly oh. it's clearly seven thousand seven hundred ninety nine. oh i'm yeah. we're not friends anymore dude Honestly, no. <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna end it right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> As always, though, everyone, yeah, go check their show out. It's really good. What I'll do is I'll link um, again their their episodes that they've done on Lefeb as well as this Lenten reflection. Um, but yeah, go give them. Go give. They're absolutely worthy of your subscription. Um, I definitely enjoy the episodes that come out from them. Um, so please do that. Everyone, as always, continue to pray for the church and for all of us. Um, Real quick, I mean, even though it's not today, but it's the vigil, I guess. Happy Feast of St. Joseph to both of you two who are husbands and Rudy, you who are a father. Um, Thank you very much. It's my yeah. baptismal anniversary tomorrow. Oh, well, wow. happy baptismal. Oh, there, gracias. Real quick, a pro tip for you, Rudy. Um, if you say your baptismal vow tomorrow, you receive a plenary indulgence with all the other prescribed measures. So that is out there. Or if you don't have the other prescribed measures, of course, you have um, that partial indulgence. So take that as a little gift from heaven. Wow. Um, Praise but, yeah, God. but yeah, you received that. So <laughs> definitely do that. Um, but yeah, everyone definitely pray for the church. Please pray that this consecration is according to the intentions of our lady of Fatima. Um, please pray for the healing of the church um, that we really do not have. Cause I mean, if anything right now with, with all the stuff, the crazy stuff going on, we didn't even talk about the synod, but, um, but it's, just like, <laughs> without, I mean, without opening that can of words, I mean, we do really face again, real, real potentiality of schism from the German bishops, as well as all this other crazy stuff, please pray to an, an end for the war and also for the restoration of just Christendom in general. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, please subscribe. So as always, everyone, thank you so much for watching. May our Lord bless you. Our lady keep you and St. Joseph watch over and protect you. God bless.